Hello, students of history. So today we're going to begin looking at the Industrial Revolution. And we have come out of the time of the War of 1812 and the era of good feelings where the United States is, has successfully defended itself from Great Britain and has got through the Panic of 1819 and has come to embrace a spirit of the frontier that the American Republic has begun to expand. And the era of good feelings in the War of 1812 has highlighted two very important factors about the United States, and that is a spirit of nationalism and sectionalism. So beware of any word that has to do with ism, but uh, they are, it's a group of closely related but ill-understood things, anything that uh, ends in ism. But we're going to examine kind of the role and the transformation that industrialism or the Industrial Revolution had upon this society. And there are so many uh, factors that are going into the transformation of America uh, in, this, uh, in this time period. But the chief and most important factor, I think, is industrialization. And this change in how human beings lived was revelatory and it changed how all life occurred uh thing how people lived how people thought how people worked um it was a fundamental change in how human beings uh, approached uh, approached the world um, and this is shaping the American Republic. It is uh, shaping the economies of the South and the North. It is shaping the economies of the expanding Western frontier, slavery. All things are revolving around the effects of the Industrial Revolution. So as I said, this is a systemic change in how the world functions. Um, and, I, and I would cite the Industrial Revolution as being the most important uh, historical change in, in, uh, since the Agricultural Revolution, which took place around 4000 BC. Um, and the reason for this is because it, it just fundamentally changes everything about human existence. Everything is different after the Industrial Revolution, and it allows for the exponential population growth of human beings and to the effects of which we are, are now seeing. It, it closes off uh, distances. You know, at times, uh, in a pre-industrial society, it would take uh, months and months for correspondence to go between uh, the even Europe and, and, uh, and the New World, and by the time that you have steamships and railroads, that correspondence can happen very quickly. And, and uh, as, as technology develops, um, it is going to allow human beings to close great gaps and distances. So uh, uh, if you had wished to send correspondence around the world, your letter uh, from India to uh, the United Kingdom um, in, eight, in, in, uh, in the year 1750, uh, it might take uh, more than a year. Um, now I can pick up my cell phone and text a friend in India, and it's instantaneous communication. So it really makes the world a much smaller place. Um, it changes how work is done. It changes how uh, consumption is done. Um, I was reading a will from the 1500s not that long ago, and a man willed 29 things. It was the sum total of all of the things that he owned. I would press uh, anyone to say, you know, look in your purse, look in your backpack, um, you know, look in your, pull everything out of your pockets. Do you own on your person at this very moment more than 29 things? Uh, the Industrial Revolution made goods consumable. They became very cheap uh, to purchase um, as well as uh, as produce. And so this just changes everything. It changes how people worked. Uh, people shifted from uh, almost an entirely agricultural existence to one of working in factories on schedules. And uh, these schedules uh, were regimented by, by uh, uh, daily time clocks rather than uh, by seasonal patterns, whereas previous agriculture work um, was regulated by the seasons um, and and uh, and by uh, by weather patterns and these sorts of things, there would be long periods of 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 uh, of relative 
uh, secession from work and that they would have leisure, lots of leisure time uh, in, in the winter season and then very intense work uh, during the, 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 uh, the planting and harvest time uh, on the farm, you know, working at every moment of daylight. But uh, with artificial lighting, uh, with the advent of the steam engine, it allows for, uh, it, it, uh, it just simply makes it a different world to work in and it, and it forces uh, human beings to adopt new patterns of work that they had never done before in the past. But I think the most quintessential here definition of the Industrial Revolution is that it is, it is a transformation from muscle power to machine power. So machines begin doing the work that previously human beings or draft animals had done. So it allows for machines to begin to do work at much greater rates than what uh, what previous generations of humans and, and draft animals could have done. And it just changes everything, as I said. This is the most fundamental change uh, in, in uh, modern times. So I want to begin here by looking at sort of the pre-industrial economy. And this was uh, a household system of production. And this is something where uh, a family would start in a trade and that they would build something. So if you were a cooper, a maker of barrels, your entire family would be involved in this trade and you would make it in your in your own household. So it would uh, the, the family would produce every single thing, generally speaking, uh, that it was involved in making of a barrel or a wheel or whatever it might be uh, from beginning to end, including all the parts. Uh, so it's not a highly efficient system like an industrial system where you're just doing one small task uh, and passing it down a line or uh, you know, coming together in large factories to produce one thing with unskilled labor. You know, These are highly skilled laborers who are all working at building one uh, great task, right? It's, and it's all brought together. It's integrated uh, and it's not separate. So the, as I say, the, the family's workshop was their house. Uh, there is, there's no uh, that you would leave to go to work at the factory or the office, but simply that you are, are going to be building your product in your home. So your home was your workshop. And here you can see several uh, slides of, of industry. And as I mentioned here earlier, we have coopers, uh, we have uh, uh, toy makers, all kinds of uh, craft industries, clock makers, and they would build everything in their homes from scratch uh, and that they would uh, all work together, the family, as one economic unit. That there wouldn't be just one person going out to do this job and that person going out to do this other job. Um, but it would be the whole family working together, and it would be uh, customary that that uh, you would bring in servants and, and uh, other apprentices to to help you if your trade was uh, was prosperous. Um, but again, this is a highly skilled system of where the master craftsman would be teaching apprentices uh, how to do things, and it takes many years uh, to perfect a trade and to be able to make something completely by hand and and uh, and from raw materials. So intensely. Uh, uh, intensely skilled laborers, uh, uh, artisans, uh, really, who uh, to to uh, to produce these goods, and they were very proud of these these things. Uh, they were were uh, and they were to to as industrialization comes about, uh, it really takes away something from the dignity of the skilled artisan when they have to go into the factory system. And also, apart from uh, uh, skilled artisans. We also just have farmers, right? The, the typical peasant family was one who uh, lived and labored and worked together, um, and their, their work schedule was aligned with seasons. It was aligned with weather patterns, with harvest, and with planting. And uh, they would, the family would work together. There was uh, a universal system of work here where, uh, you know, women do not uh, stay at home in the households and look after uh, only things in the household. This is a much later industrial development. Um, everyone is working on the farm. Um, and, uh, and, and, and work is oriented around tasks. So if you have to plant a field, you know, once you're done planting the field, then you would have more leisure time 
Um, and whereas uh, in industrial labor, you're showing up every day for the same amount of time, doing the same job, day after day after day. There's no periods of rest uh, in, designed in industrial labor, where this is very different in the pre-industrial economy. And I have here uh, just a chart of sort of the GDP or world manufacturing output, uh, the gross domestic product of the Industrial Revolution period, which really begins around 1750 and, and, uh, and concludes in the early 20th century. Uh, but for our period here from 1800, really is you can see that the United States was not uh, an industrial power whatsoever um, in, in uh, pre-1800 and really even at 1800, but it begins to pick up pace enormously uh, around uh, the, you know, in the first couple decades of the, of the 19th century. And uh, especially later than that with the expansion of the canal systems, highways, uh, um, and, uh, and, and railroad networks uh, after 1840. So we see, you can see here kind of an exponential growth of the United States' economy that uh, it would go from having less than uh, one-tenth of one percent uh, all the way to controlling nearly um, one-quarter of the world's GDP uh, by the year 1900. So that is a, a radical shift in, in the amount of manufacturing uh, output in the United States. And most of this, of course, is coming after the year 1820 or even 1830, um, when you really began to see manufacturing uh, increase exponentially in the United States. So what was the impact of this transformation? So what we see here is a change from a, a family household cottage industry economy to one of a market economy where people are uh, working in factories um, and and they are working to earn wages and not to produce uh, products um, it is produced by a family it is an, an instead of a uh, a factory or workshop and also we see here a transformation from uh, you know a family uh, producing things uh, in a in a uh, a, a locally self-sufficient economy to one of a mass consumption economy. So the Industrial Revolution brings with it mass consumption because goods are, can be produced so cheaply um, that you can buy many more things. And, and through this, uh, more industry is, is spawned, right? That you can create more and more things and there, it creates and generates more and more wealth because there's more jobs, there's more money, uh, the, all these kinds of things. So commerce uh, begins to thrive. Uh, and and uh, through this uh, economy of consumption, uh, really a capitalistic system, um, it, uh, it, it creates uh, massive amounts of wealth as well as goods uh, that were bought, traded, sold uh, in, in, uh, in this early industrial economy. And in the pre-industrial economy, really, everyone is working, everyone is trying to produce a product, and we see a shift here that there's going to be a change in, in, uh, in, in gender roles that the, the male in the household the, the, uh, is going to be uh, usually the father of the family, the patriarch, if you will. Um, is going to be asked to go out into the world and to uh, produce enough money, uh, you know, to uh, to provide for for his family, and that the uh, the wife, uh, the mother, uh, the matriarch of the family will will uh, will stay at home and raise the uh, the many children and take care of household goods. She might uh, uh, have some some form of trade that she would do, such as ale making or or uh, uh, seamstress work, something like that, but it would be something that is contained within the household and then the man would go out in the world to, to work. So we see this shift in industrial uh, time periods. This is not how things were in previous periods. Rather, the whole family is working together uh, in farm labor uh, or in uh, artisan uh, production. So we see that there are two main periods of the Industrial Revolution. So you have the kind of the, the first industrial revolution here, uh, as it's often termed, and, and this is, in keeping in mind, a very academic thing to do to, to really separate and say these are the dates for a particular uh, revolution that took place as, as though it just suddenly stopped in 1840 and then picked back up again and did something else in, in 1880. But this is, this is a living system that is, is uh, growing uh, constantly, and it's not really just the end of one and the beginning of another, but we see a transition from uh, to, to 
the kinds of inventions that were taking place, the building materials, transportation methods, as well as production. Um, so we see uh, a change from a steam engine to the advent of electricity after the year 1880. Um, we see a, sh a shift from iron to steel. We see uh, a, a shift from uh, the canal system to a mass railroad system, even internal combustion engines. So you will have cars and these sorts of things and, and uh, new factory systems. Um, that go into place uh, throughout uh, the, the United States, which creates the largest economy um, in mo uh, modern history. So I want to take just some time here uh, to talk about, we, we haven't actually got to sort of the transformation of the factory yet, um, but you can't have a mass industrialized system without first having some means of transporting goods. Um, without the, the advent of new means of transportation throughout the United States because it is landlocked uh, or the vast majority of your territory is landlocked, uh, you, are, you are therefore there's kind of a stranglehold on industry that it would have to be very near port cities with, uh, as, as the only means of conveyance is, is draft animals that can carry about 250 to 300 pounds. Uh, over over very limited distances at a time, um, we see uh, we see society, the American society, really moving forward uh, through. And I could go through uh, you know the myopia of oh the, you know this act and this president did this and that, but I'm just going to take the the grander sweeping arc of history here and say that highway systems were developed by states and even by private individuals. That the what we call turnpikes. Uh, Roads that were produced and fees were charged for using them. These are very good paved roads, better than you know, much better than dirt paths. That uh, when it rains, it renders the roads impassable. Um, but good paved uh, roads that allow for the transport of, of with uh, with large wagons uh, and, and these kinds of things, or or railroads. Uh, not really. We're not in the, the period of railroads yet, but uh, but uh, large pack animals uh, being able to move things as quickly and, and easily as possible, hills removed, um, but states would uh, would fund these kinds of things. Uh, the national government would get into the business of funding them. There's much uh, debate uh, kind of between the political parties about how much to get involved uh, with, with turnpikes and whether they should, uh, whether the national bank should contribute large amounts of money uh, to, the, to uh, highway systems and whatnot, and even private individuals and corporations uh, come together to uh, expand the road system. But nevertheless, this occurs, and numerous amounts of road systems are built uh, throughout the United States, and especially uh, in, in the West, right, beyond Appalachia the Appalachian Mountains, um, it began to see numerous uh, new road systems built. So therefore, you can get agricultural produce uh, from cotton and corn and wheat, uh, all of these kinds of, uh, of, of uh, raw commodities to the factories that are in, uh, in the port cities for production. So we also see as well the, uh, the, the United States has many navigable rivers, very good, large navigable rivers, including the Ohio River, the, the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, uh, and the many tributaries that come from these, these, uh, these large river systems. And uh, before the creation of the steam engine, there is, is a very, very long time frame in order to get uh, sort of barges that were pushed by poles or pulled by draft animals or using uh, 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 human muscle through rowing uh, or uh, other, other means of the wind uh, to, to get from, say, Louisville, Kentucky. This is just one example to get from Louisville, Kentucky to uh, New Orleans would take three to four months on a loaded barge. When the steamboat, uh, the steam engine, which uh, is uh, put onto the, uh, the, a large vessel and it is able to use a water wheel to propel the boat through, uh, through, the, the, through using steam power, this cuts the journey time uh, from three to four months to 25 to 30 days. So that reduces enormously the amount of costs as well as the, the it increases uh, greatly the amount of load that can be uh, can be taken on the vessel itself. So all of this promotes efficiency in the industrial production process, and it reduces the price of goods. So your transportation costs go down enormously. And there was also the building of canals. And the most famous canal built from 1817 to 1825 is the Erie Canal. 
And this was the brainchild of Governor DeWitt Clinton. And uh, he was made fun of enormously. They called it Clinton's ditch and Clinton's folly. And uh, uh, he was he was uh, berated publicly for this, this insane idea to create a canal, right? An artificial river that linked uh, Lake Erie at Buffalo, present day Buffalo, New York, um, to the uh, the Hudson uh, the Hudson River, and this would have to cross 360 miles, and it would uh, it would have to allow ships to be raised more than 564 feet, right from water level to water level. You would have to cross more than 564 feet. That's nearly two football fields high. Um, so they did this by creating this lock system, 34 uh, locks. So a, a boat would sail into it. It would uh, they would artificially raise the water through steam pumps and and uh, these sorts of things, um, and it would uh, stair step up, and then it would sail away on flat ground, and then they would have to stair step up again and again and again and again. Eventually, and it got all the way through. Um, so this would reduce the. Um, uh, the time of having to use draft animals to make this same journey of, of 350 miles, uh, it would change it from, you know, being, being uh, months uh, to one of being about nine days. So it's, it's highly efficient, um, and it uh, reduced shipping costs from the Great Lakes region um, to the East Coast by about 95%. So that is cutting your shipping costs by 95%. That is enormous uh, in promoting your efficiency. And uh, the Erie Canal really saw its heyday uh, in the, from the, the, uh, the 1830s into the 1860s. Uh, but uh, its peak year, more than 33,000 ships passed through the Erie Canal. So it was, it was a highly successful um, business venture, and many, many followed after it because, uh, you, of course, you charged people to, uh, to ship their goods along the canal. And many towns and, and uh, uh, places along, the, uh, along the, uh, uh, the route grew out of this. So, you know, present-day Rochester, New York is, is one of the canal towns. Um, so it, it uh, itself in, inspires and creates um, much urban development in service industry because these people who were operating the boats and the vessels and the pump stations along the uh, along the canal, of course, had to live somewhere and had to be uh, to be fed and entertained and and somewhere to spend their money. So we see the growth of uh, see the promotion here of industry industrialization. Uh, promoting urban growth as well as uh, creating an economy in and of itself. But through the creation of highways, canals, and the use of steam-powered vessels on uh, the many navigable rivers of the, uh, the North American continent, we see a, a revolution in, in uh, the transportation industry uh, from the uh, beginning in the early 1800s uh, up until uh, you know, nearly 1900. So let us look at kind of industrial work and the conditions that uh, that the people who did this uh, had to uh, endure or enjoy. So the first problem with unregulated industry is, of course, pollution. And before the creation of steam power, any kind of mill, so a mill can just mean it's uh, really synonymous with factory, um, but mills, uh, they created textile goods, uh, they ground uh, grains from agricultural um, production. So it's uh, turning a raw material such as cotton or wheat uh, into a, uh, a usable product such as flour and cloth. And then from there it would go somewhere else to be made into a suit or bread, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these kinds of things. So it's the transformation of raw materials uh, into uh, usable products happen in mills, um, but as you do this, of course, you they are using steam power. Previously, you had to build mills along swift flowing streams, uh, which was good in the 1700s because the the United States and uh, the British colonies had a lot of really swift moving streams that allowed for water wheels to be turned in order to generate uh, uh, you know movement uh, on the on the machines that were used in the production of raw materials into usable materials, but. With the advent of the steam engine, the, the real game changer here is the use of the steam engine, which allows for factories to be produced in large cities. 
and you can create large urban centers uh, in areas where there is not necessarily a fast moving stream and, and the factories can be very large uh, because you can use lots of steam engines to power the machines in them. So we see a, a movement from mills being uh, in rural areas near streams uh, to, to large cities such as, uh, such as New York or Boston. But the problem with that, um, and we see this not just in the United States, but uh, in Great Britain, and it's really the, the poster child for this is Great Britain, um, but we see massive sources of pollution, especially in the cities of Birmingham and, and Manchester, which Frederick Engels writes his, uh, his famous uh, novel about that inspires he and, and Karl Marx to uh, come up with uh, the theories of, of, uh, involved with communism in reaction to the, the horrible conditions that the factory systems produce um, because it is enormous amount of pollution because what what are you burning uh, when you when you have to boil the very large amounts of water that go into uh, steam production to steam power to turn the turbines and the steam engines um, well it is coal of course, and coal uh, burnt uh, with no filters or, or any such devices uh, creates uh, a terrible, terrible uh, amount of pollution. So we see in these industrial towns uh, more than 200 uh, carcinogenic chemicals, um, as well as the, the very noisy machines that, uh, that uh, are also used in these places. So enormous amounts of pollution, and keeping in mind human beings have to live and work in these places for many years and would develop diseases that, that uh, come from long-term exposure to uh, carcinogens, such as you know, cancer. Um, so we, uh, we have to take, take into uh, consideration the, not only the, uh, the great effects of the of industrial production but also the sort of the harmful effects of of industrial production upon uh, the people that were doing most of the producing and the people who were doing most of the producing of course had to live close to the factories because we don't live in an age yet where there are trains and places that you can get far away from these places that are uh, pumping uh noxious chemicals and smells and noise they lived in in slums very near the uh, the factories in these urban centers um, so we see the growth of uh, you know the 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 of working class housing uh, where people are forced to live in very uh, confined conditions often with wind uh, very few windows if no windows at all uh, where the streets were polluted uh, they would have to throw their own waste out onto the streets uh, and I do mean uh, urine and feces uh, as well as vomit or anything else uh, from the production of, of uh, uh, the human body. So we, we see a very horrendous living conditions for early industrial laborers uh, in, in large cities. So this itself creates uh, a new class structure. So we began to see um, an upper class, which I mean have, have kind of always been with society in, in an aristocracy, but uh, a class of leisure that uh, do not have to participate in work whatsoever, um, that have, uh, have distanced themselves from, from trade. Uh, in the United States, you don't see this nearly as much as you do in Europe, um, but that is really a hallmark of being in the upper classes or the leisured classes in Europe is that you do not participate in trade. In the United States, you can be a member of the upper class and still have some dealings uh, in trade, um, but uh, for the most part, your goal here is to be uh, a leisured individual, that you have, have, do not have to work for your money anymore, uh, that you have made so much money that uh, you don't have to, to uh, enter into the world of work anymore. Think of people like Andrew Carnegie. But uh, then we see the growth of a middle-class professional, such as lawyers and physicians, those people who uh, earn their livings uh, as clerks who are coming to uh, to do the business and the accounting, uh, the administration, the you know that uh, requires uh, people who have professional educational training in, in complex mathematics, engineering, uh, those who are creating uh, new factory systems. Uh, sort of so the urban professional is born, and this is the, really the middle class individual, those who are uh, involved in uh, industrial production, uh, but only in the sense that they are doing the human managing as well as. Uh, uh, invention uh, and, and of, the, uh, of the systems that uh, the working class then, uh, those who are doing the physical labor involved with uh, industrial production are, are doing.
So you would see a flight from these these uh, these suburbs, or excuse me, these these uh, inner city areas to suburbs by middle and upper class people. So you see uh, a differentiation, a transformation of the cities as well as the kind of industrial districts uh, where the working class lived and the much uh, farther out uh, regions, which we now will call suburbs, uh, where uh, the the uh, the middle and leisured classes uh, lived. Who could afford to uh, to have transportation into where they worked uh, from uh, from you know uh, stagecoach and and uh, later streetcars and and trains and these sorts of things. So really important here to keep in mind that there is a a rigid class structure and you could see this in people's dress you know the wearing of white collars uh, would be you know distinguish you as a, a middle class or upper class individual uh, from that of the working class uh, you know those who did not wear uh, you know collared shirts and and and, uh, and and labored intensely so the the overalls or the the blue or browns you know the the working man's clothes and we see it a uh, uh, a really increasingly large uh, maldistribution of wealth here um, that we see uh, a quickly an industrialization a growth of a very rich owning class uh, uh, of capitalists and and uh, and then the upper level management uh, to those who are doing most of the laboring so even the low level administration uh, who might be considered middle class might not make very much money think of uh, in the christmas carol um, uh, bob cratchit right the famous christmas story written by charles dickens actually about this time in uh, uh, in our in our history line here um so it was uh, you know he uh, bob cratchit of course doesn't make a lot of money but he is a middle class person he's a low level uh, clerk administrator um but just because of that as i say it doesn't mean that uh, just because you're middle class doesn't mean necessarily that you are are wealthy often but it can lead uh, to more wealth but we see a radical uh, um maldistribution of wealth here uh, that the working class is becoming they have to work enormously long hours for small rates of pay as industrialization gains force and, and continues to grow and grow and this this therefore increases the number of poor and uh, of course trade is is uh, based upon capitalism's boom and bust cycles um, so uh, there could be people who are put out of work well, very large numbers of people put out of work such as in the panic of 1819 um, you know we see uh, in some industrial cities as many as 75 uh, percent of the laborers in various trades that are uh, put out of work entirely. So you have enormous amounts of poor, and there's no social safety net, of course, either. They're forced to resort to uh, the church um, for the um, uh, for aid and poor relief. Uh, so there's really, uh, it is really difficult life in, in, industri uh, in industrial labor. Um, but what, uh, what uh, leads up to these kinds of conditions? Um, we see a exodus of people uh, who are gobbling up farmland uh, throughout the west uh, all the way into the mississippi river valley which uh, with thomas jefferson's purchase uh, the louisiana purchase um, as well as the continued uh, migration of peoples um, into the west we see the the creation of small farms and the production of uh, large-scale productions of um, of agricultural goods that then need to be shipped back to the east coast for uh, production uh, as or, or, or refinement and production as well as shipping to other markets of course they would be being sent to europe which is also uh, large growing populations of uh, of people that that, uh, that are taking off enormously um, and with the production of manufacturing, we see a decline of slavery in the north, um, and we see uh, many new inventions. This is a great age of invention, and I could mention a lot of these, but I am just going to keep this to Eli Whitney's cotton gin, um, which allowed uh, for you to put raw cotton into a machine, and you would turn a crank initially. Later, it's going to be mechanized and made much, much larger, um, but it would separate the seeds uh, from the cotton itself. Uh, before this is a very laborious task of picking all the seeds out of out of a cotton plant. So, uh, this way, you can just throw the cotton in raw, uh, and it would. Uh, this machine would clean the seeds out, and this this revolutionized the production of cotton. And that cotton could be then turned very quickly um, into thread and and uh, eventually usable cloth. 
and uh, Whitney was a very famous inventor, and it was uh, it was said of him in a in a magazine once that uh, or a newspaper that he, that he can make anything. Uh, that he was uh, he was just such a such a great inventor and a genius. And as we we kind of survey. What, uh, what were the key crops in, the, in uh, North America? Well, of course, if you look to the islands, the, the, uh, uh, the Caribbean islands, the, in the, the uh, age of colonization, sugar is key. That is the most fundamental crop. But if you look to North America, which can't grow much sugar, at least uh, in the New England area and, and even farther north, it's not a very ideal sugar-growing climate. Uh, they had been producing tobacco in large scale, um, but cotton becomes, uh, with the invention of the cotton gin, um, we see a, an explosion of, of, uh, of farms that are producing cotton, cotton crops. We see growing populations. We see a demand for more cloth and more clothes consumption economies growing and therefore producers shift from tobacco products to cotton crops so you can see here on this map the explosion of cotton production across uh, the the uh, early united states and with the production of cotton which is intensely uh, laborious uh, is the growth of slavery again we saw slavery decline in the north uh, but we see an explosion of slavery um, and the the uh, the growth of, of slaves, uh, a slave labor throughout the South, where all the cotton production is uh, is being produced, and this creates, of course, a a uh, monoculture. This is this is what Thomas Jefferson feared. He was terrified of this that you would have all these massive uh, interlocking systems of commerce, and rather he saw um, the the quintessential economic unit as a person living freely and producing everything that uh, he or she would consume as a, as a family, uh, and not that they would be bound to producing one large monoculture crop um, that uh, would, would then eventually create problems uh, because they are then reliant on this cash crop instead of a um, a multi-layered uh, farm uh, rural existence. Um, so this is this is what begins to happen is the creation of a sort of a monoculture cash crop uh, system throughout the American South. Uh, that uh, and this system is entirely dependent upon slave labor in order to produce. And, and all the cotton is produced in the South, and the raw materials, the cotton bales are sent up to the north where they are put through uh, cotton gins, uh, transformed into threads and cloth, um, and then produced in all these factories in, in the north. Um, so slave labor here is key. So there's just a, a quick chart of, you can see how uh, cotton production correlates to the growth of, uh, of slavery in the United States here. So we go all the way from uh, in, in uh, 1790 to only having uh, only having uh, about three quarters of a million slaves, uh, and they're producing three th approximately three thousand cotton bales. And by the year 1860, we have more than 4.4 million slaves and the production of 3.8 million cotton bales. So let us look at uh, some of this production and how it worked. And one of the most famous examples of this is uh, Lowell Mills, uh, the, the great mill complex in, uh, in Massachusetts. So Francis Cabot Lowell in the year 1814 began to have, or he had an idea that he wanted to create this sort of idyllic mill. Uh, it was all self-contained and uh, the... Um, uh, the laborers lived there, that they had green spaces, had adequate housing, um, and, uh, and therefore, and they would, uh, they would have lectures uh, from Harvard professors. Literally, they would bring down people from Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, from Harvard, and they would, uh, they would give lectures on philosophy and morality, and they would, uh, they would teach these people to read and write that worked there. It was a very paternalistic uh, kind of a system of inculcating middle-class uh, middle culture um, into working-class, uh, ill-educated rural people and this was all done uh, through the workshop uh, through the mill uh, where they were paid uh, decent rates and and uh, it was a very idyllic mill system 
Actually, they renamed the, the town of Walton, Massachusetts uh, into uh, uh, to Lowell, Massachusetts after this famous system. And one of Lowell's uh, great ideas was that he was going to use young female laborers instead of men because, well, you can pay them less, uh, and, uh, and they would take in people who were paid extremely low wages, who, uh, who had not uh, been able to enter into society because it was, it was uh, thought that you had to, of course, be married, and uh, it, was, it was very important to have this familial structure. So Lowe wanted to, to use um, young uh, female laborers uh, from uh, approximately 15 years old to 30 years old, um, who had uh, had been on the margins of society and and to uh, and to help them uh, get uh, get a, a leg up on uh, on uh, on working and on life uh, and so they would not be marginalized in in the rural areas of uh, of New England so they he literally would have um, uh, agents that would go through the countryside scouring the countryside uh, to to find these people and sign them up and sure enough he did he found. 5,000 ready laborers, um, and they paid them reasonably well um, and, uh, and taught them uh, all of these things that I was talking about to philosophy, morality, uh, that they would be uh, inculcated into these, uh, to these young ladies who, who began working at the, at the mill. So they would typically not marry until much later. They would have far less children. They were paid higher wages for, uh, for working in, in the mill. Um, than they would be at uh, rural uh, jobs. Uh, for instance, a, a, a person working at Lowell Mill could expect to make about a dollar and 25 cents, a dollar and 15 cents to a dollar and 25 cents a week. I know that doesn't sound like much in our modern times, but that's a reasonably decent wage uh, in the early 1800s for a single lady. Um, whereas as a seamstress, uh, the, the same woman could expect to make uh, approximately around 65 to 75 cents for a week's uh, week's labor in the, the countryside. And of course, uh, in the mill, this included uh, housing uh, and, uh, and uh, very often food. So as I, I was saying here, the uh, Lowell says he doesn't want his workers to have to live in slums because he feels that uh, they would work better. They would be better uh, they would, he would get more production out of them if they were lived in some decent uh, rooms and were fed reasonably well and as well as having certain regulations about the times that they would work. Um, and so therefore, uh, he creates these houses, these boarding houses, um, and uh, he would, of course, have them. Uh, it's a very paternalistic system that uh, he was, uh, you know, looking after these ladies, and, and the managers were looking after them, and, and uh, that they were producing a well-educated group of, of uh, young people who are working uh, to better themselves, to rise in the social, uh, their social conditions. So the hours were not uh, not as grueling as, as the later industrial production, uh, but they were expected to work six, uh, six days a week for uh, anywhere from eight to ten hours. And of course there's strict gender um, divisions here where uh, only the women are going to work together, of course, with uh, male managers, uh, but uh, all the women would be working together, um, but they would be paid a, a decent wage for this. So we see a transformation of factory work uh, based upon uh, now the Lowell system is is really the idyllic model here uh, it was uh, it was somewhat successful um, but market forces are going to change factory work drastically beginning in the late 1830s and, and 1840s so as patents are lost of course inventors will file a patent with the you know the international system uh, and therefore when these things begin to expire and other places can begin to use the same technologies and pay lower wages uh, you just can't compete in a capitalistic system uh, if you keep paying high wages and provide housing and all these sorts of things because other people are going to undercut you and they want to keep producing a lower and lower cheaper cheaper price product um, and by doing that, of course, the consumer can pay way less for it, but the laborer who is making the goods also is going to have to get uh, paid um, paid a lot less. So we see here the effects of capitalism and of competition uh, among the factory owners. Um, 
so it can be a double-edged sword here. So what did uh, factory owners do? How did they have to respond to this? Well, in uh, the Lowell factory, uh, they said we're going to have to cut wages by 15%, and then they're going to have to cut wages by uh, 25%. And so the uh, the ladies uh, walked out, uh, or many of them uh, end up walking out, uh, and they're eventually uh, replaced uh, by by cheaper immigrant labor. Uh, so they're going to have to produce more for less money uh, and with less people uh, in order to compete with um, with other with other factories who are are adopting similar similar practices. So as I say, many of them worked out and um, uh, they attempted to unionize. They attempted to lobby the president of the United States. They, uh, they tried to uh, get the system uh, reformed, but all of this ultimately failed. Uh, while unions were created, uh, this was really the infancy of collective bargaining, um, but uh, they're, they're simply run out, uh, right? Uh, uh, Private security forces are used against those who attempt to, to unionize. Uh, uh, the leaders are rounded up and fired, um, and, uh, and, and or the entire uh, people who are threatening to strike are fired, and they are thrown out of the factories, and they are replaced with cheaper uh, immigrant labor. Of course, remembering that uh, the 1840s brought about the Irish potato famine, so there are millions, literally millions, three Point two million Irish people immigrate to the United States in the 1840s. This is called the Hungry Forties in Europe, and not just in Ireland, but we see mass uh, influxes of immigration into the United States, uh, providing a ready and cheap, very, very cheap uh, source of labor to, to, uh, to immediately input into the industrialized system. So this continues to promote uh, enormously low wages, um, in uh, in all of the mills. So as as I was saying here, there's a just a simply a decline of this idyllic mill system here. Uh, we see a, a just a massive transformation of the system, and uh, with the advent of new labor, uh, it brings about a new type of industrialism and the status of uh, therefore of the factory worker, the textile worker, the mill worker is changed. It's going to be just like the laborers in, um, in, in England that are described, or, or in France that are described so well in, in uh, Les, uh, Les Miserables, right? Uh, or, uh, or Frederick uh, Ingalls' is, is great work about Manchester. Uh, these horrible working conditions for low wages where people are working uh, 14 hours, 16 hours a day, six days a week uh, for just pennies on the job, um, as well as this... Uh, uh, this class of uh, this working class people being just the uh, the dregs of society, only just uh, barely a step up uh, above those who are homeless. Um, so we see a just a transformation here of the working class, or the image of the working class individual here as someone who is just very uh, is just at the absolute bottom of society, unskilled labor, uh, and and they are very much treated this way. So we see a, a rigid status, a social hierarchy developing out of this, and and one of the reactions to this um, to this industrialization is the Romantic movement, and I'll probably talk more about this in uh, my next lecture. Um, but there was a reaction um, by by many thinkers, you know, and Karl Marx is, is among them, but, but by poets and, and, uh, and, and great thinkers such as Henry David Thoreau. Um, and they saw industrialism in the age of industry as one as just being a blight on uh, the, the history of humanity. And they saw in industrialism the absolute worst exploits of human beings, the destruction of the natural world, um, and and uh, the destroying of the human condition. So uh, Thoreau uh, abandoned society, and he goes to Walden Pond, and he lives out in the wilderness for a very long time, and he gets back in touch with, with nature and with his own spirituality and his, his humanity. And, and uh, these, uh, these poets and these writers and thinkers, and another famous one is John Muir, who is responsible for uh, the creation of... Um, uh, the the national park system and and specifically um, Yosemite National Park in the Sierra Nevada mountains in in uh, California, but these thinkers see 
something that is beautiful about the pre-industrial society of the family working together, self-sustaining. This is right in line with kind of this Jeffersonian uh, demo uh, democratic value of the individual, right? The, the, the freedom of the individual to produce their own goods, to live as they choose, so long as they harm no one else. Um, and being self-sufficient. Um, and, and Muir and Thoreau and, and, and others like them, they argue strongly that uh, you have to move away from industrialization, that you should reject industrialization and you should seek to live as your ancestors have lived for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and, uh, and they look back upon the pre-industrial era as a romantic era. Uh, and, uh, and they really, uh, they overlook all the bad parts about it and they really highlight the worst, uh, worst things about uh, the, the uh, industrial urban movement. And, and, um, uh, but this is, this is one of the reactions against uh, the, the, uh, the industrial revolution. Uh, and I say, as I say, probably more on that later, but um, I hope in this lecture that you have come to have an appreciation for how uh, industry transformed all facets of American life, uh, from workers to managers to the upper class and those who live in the far west, those in the south, those who are slaves, um, and those who are living in uh, New England and in the manufacturing north. So uh, as we see a, uh, a, a division here of society from the agricultural, uh, the production, uh, the raw production of the South and the West uh, under slave labor to one of, of uh, manufacturing uh, and industrial production and urbanization in the North. So thanks for watching. <laughs>